Um, <coughs> so I'm going to be talking today about higher dimensional hyperbolic orbifolds. So um, in particular, arithmetic hyperbolic reflection groups. Um, well, sometimes I confuse a group and the um, quotient space, the corresponding orbifold. But um, anyways, um, hopefully I'll keep that straight most of the time. So this is uh, will be a, um, this is joint work with Bill Petsky, Storm, and White. Um, <clears throat> so the goal of the talk then will be slightly different than yesterday's talk. Um, I'll first explain these terms in the title. So I'll talk a bit about reflection groups, and then um, I'll try to explain something about arithmetic groups, and then combine the two. Talk about arithmetic reflection groups in hyperbolic space. <clears throat> and then I'll state the main theorem uh, once we have this background. And I'll sketch uh, some of the ingredients um, of the proof of the theorem. OK, so first um, I'll briefly discuss reflection groups, which were mentioned in Tim Schroeder's talk yesterday. So an abstract reflection group has a presentation with a number of generators, could be infinite, um, and then relators, which are indexed um, by numbers, integers, or infinite, infinity, mij. So the ai times aj to the power of mij is equal to 1, um, with the condition that mij is equal to mji. So, um, Actually, the, we can just assume that i is less than j um, when we take these relations. And um, on the diagonal, it's equal to 1, which corresponds to the fact that every element is an involution. Um, every, every generator is an involution. And um, <clears throat> if mij is infinity, then there's no relation here. We, don't, we can just assume that ai times aj has infinite order. So um, these groups were. These sort of groups are introduced by Coxeter. They originate geometrically from taking a polyhedron in some sort of geometry. And the AIs correspond to the faces of the polyhedron. Um, and the group then is generated by reflections in the faces. And the fundamental domain for the action of the group will be this polyhedron itself. <clears throat> so I'll describe this a little more precisely. But um, you can consider just these sort of groups abstractly presented, and that's the notion of a, of a reflection group. So the simplest example where you see the relations coming in are the dihedral groups. So in this case, your polyhedron then is infinite. It's just this infinite wedge. And um, in this case here, we have um, the polyhedron is bounded by two planes. The, there's an angle between them of pi over 3. So this is just in two dimensions. And we have these, uh, three, or these three lines coming together. This could, uh, this could work in any dimension. So you could have planes in um, n, n minus one dimensional planes in n dimensions, if you like. But um, this is just a two dimensional picture. And so we label the two faces of the polyhedron by a1 and a2. And then here's the presentation of the group. So this is just a uh, dihedral group of order 6. And um, so m12 here is equal to 3. And if I compose the two reflections here, um, if I reflect through a1, it fixes this line. Then reflecting through a2 will send this line over to here. So it acts as a rotation um, uh, through an angle of 2 pi over 3. Um, oh, it's just a 2 pi over 3 there, sorry. So, um, so this is where the presentations for these Coxeter groups come in. So um, if I have adjacent faces of a polyhedron and the dihedral angle is pi over mj, then they'll generate a finite dihedral group of order 2 mij. So in general, an N generator reflection group, um, well, you can always realize it in some sort of geometry. So there's this construction of tits. Um, you get a, 
a linear action, if it's n generator, you get a linear action on a certain convex subset of Rn, um, the tits cone, with fundamental domain of polyhedron, and the dihedral angles are um, given by pi over Mij in the Hilbert metric, uh, which I'm not going to describe, um, but it's a fairly naturally defined metric. So, um, but in this talk, we'll be interested um, principally in the hyperbolic reflection groups, but also spherical and Euclidean. Um, give us some examples of those. So, um, so these these don't necessarily come from Titz's construction, but somewhat related construction. Um, <clears throat> okay, so and I should say that Coxeter was the one to introduce these. They're also called Coxeter groups, as I mentioned, and they they generalize. Um, well, some of the original ones were the vial groups uh, associated with Lie algebras, which are finite reflection groups. Um, let's see. Uh, I'd have to. I think so. Yeah. 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 It is. So here's a picture of a hyperbolic reflection group in um, two dimensions. Um, this is the 237 reflection group in the Klein model. Um, and I believe this is also actually the uh, tits cone. So this is three generators, so it actually would lie in um, three dimensions. But if you take, it's, it's, um, it's a cone over the origin. So if you look at the projective picture, this would be the picture in RP2. Um, and in fact, the Hilbert metric in this case is just the um, is just the uh, hyperbolic metric in the Klein model. So the Hilbert metric. Well, I guess I I can't explain it. Um, you take two points, and um, since it's a convex set, you take the line going through there, and you take the cross ratio of these four points, and you take the logarithm of that, and that's the distance between the two points, and that gives you the hyperbolic metric in this Klein model. So in this case. Geodesics are just straight lines, and this is actually, um, if you were to live inside of hyperbolic three space, and you saw a copy of, you saw this geodesic plane in hyperbolic three space, this two-dimensional plane that had um, this reflection group acting, this is actually precisely what you would see. So you can imagine this plane, um, unlike in Euclidean space where a plane goes off infinitely far in each direction. In hyperbolic space, a geodesic plane will have will take up a finite amount of your view. And um, if you look at it, you'll see um, you'll see these triangles sort of going off into the horizon and growing sort of exponentially um, as you, as they go away. And um, lines in hyperbolic space, even though in the model I had yesterday, they look they look um, circular to Euclidean eyes, well, every, every line, if I look at a, a geodesic, there's this reflection that preserves that and preserves um, my, my eyeball, and so I'm actually going to see a, a, a straight line. So in, in hyperbolic space, geodesics actually look like lines. So this is the correct um, picture of what a hyperbolic plane looks like with hyperbolic eyes. So, um, as Tim mentioned yesterday, Andreev characterized combinatorially the reflection polyhedra P and H3 in terms of the dihedral angles and the one skeleton of S2. Um, and I'm not going to explain that, but um, anyways, this is a precursor to Thurston's geometrization conjecture in the orbifold theorem. So these conditions on the dihedral angles are basically ruling out um, spherical Sub, two-dimensional two spherical suborbifolds and two-dimensional Euclidean suborbifolds, which would be obstructions to the polyhedron being hyperbolic. Um, now, Wimberg proved that, well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So for a hyperbolic reflection group um, in n dimensions where P is compact, he proved that there's, there's no such polyhedron if the dimension is greater than or equal to 30. And then Prokhorov showed 
that um, if you look at finite volume reflection polyhedra, they don't exist in dimensions greater than or equal to 996. And the largest dimension um, of, an, of an example is in 21 dimensions. There's an example to Bohr shards in 21 dimensions. So um, there's sort of a gap between, uh, between what's known and what's, I mean, there's this probably not much more than 21's probably pushing the limit. Um, but so far, no one's been able to work that out. Okay, so that's um, a little bit of, uh, well, definitions of reflection groups. Now I'll talk about ar arithmetic groups. Um, which are introduced in the, the in full generality um, by Borel um, and Harsh Andre, I guess too. Um, so I'm only going to be talking about a somewhat special case of arithmetic groups. But um, so you have G is an algebraic subgroup of GLN, and um, K is a number field. So GLN is just n by n matrices with determinant non-zero over some unspecified number field. Um, and then you can plug in whatever number field you like to GLN. So um, we can take K to be a number field, or you can, I mean any field actually, not just number fields. OK is uh, the integers in K. And then um, G of K is going to be a subgroup of GLNK. So these are just linear, these are linear algebraic groups. They're, groups of matrices. And then um, we can take gamma to be G of K intersected with the integral points of GLN K. So they, we just, we only take matrices with integral coefficients and whose determinant is an invertible element in the number, in the ring of integers of the number field. Um, so that's, that's what this means here. <coughs> then, um, Gamma is an arithmetic subgroup of, so we actually want to get a Lie group. So to get a Lie group, what we do is we take um, GLN and every, um, every entry there, we replace it with K tensored with R over Q. So um, if K has degree, um, degree uh, M over, over Q, then um, this will be an M by M matrix. So it's just a, a natural representation of a number field into an n by m matrix n by m matrix um, and then we have and then now this is a lie group over r so it's a, it's a group of m times n d d dimension m times n matrices over r now so you get something that acts on some euclidean space and then um, and then we have the associated subgroup um, corresponding to our subgroup g now, um, so this is a special type of arithmetic group. The more, the more general type is when you just take a gamma prime less than this Lie group. It doesn't necessarily have to be defined over this number field. And um, if it's commensurable with gamma, then it's also arithmetic. So if gamma prime is commensurable with a, a gamma that's defined in this fashion, then it's arithmetic. So commensurable means that if we look at gamma intersected with gamma prime, that's finite index in both gamma prime and gamma. So commensurable subgroups are very close to each other. <clears throat> um, now the remarkable fact is that um, when, when you have this condition here, if G is this algebraic subgroup, then this gamma here, well, there's a Haar measure defined on this Lie group. Um, there's a essentially unique uh, me measure on the Lie group. And it turns out that gamma would be finite covolume with respect to that Haar measure. So that's, that's a non-trivial theorem to prove. Um, that's, it's a, so it'll be a lattice, in other words, inside of this Lie group here. Um, if gamma is arithmetic, um, then gamma prime is arithmetic as well, but actually, we want to, th this is still not the most general version of an arithmetic group. What you're allowed to do is take such a construction and then project down um, to a, a smaller dimensional Lie group if, you're, um, if the kernel of that projection is a compact factor. So I'll give an example on the next page. Um, 
Now, basically because GLN OK, the ring of integers in a number field is discrete in K tensor Q of R, this is just some lattice inside of this vector space, then, um, then gamma will be discrete inside of GLN. If it's discrete in GLN, it'll be discrete in this subgroup G as well. So that's where the discreteness of this group comes from. Okay, so here's some examples. So um, the classical examples of arithmetic groups come from number theory, from studying um, Diophantian equations where you have a quadratic form such as this and you want to figure out whether um, there's an integer that can be represented by that quadratic form. So whether there's some solution of qn of x equals a particular integer where the x's have to be um, integers. So this is a Diophantian equation. And to solve such an equation, you might have one solution, but then um, there might be many more solutions coming from automorphisms of this quadratic form. Um, so you, um, in order to have an algorithm to determine whether you can represent a number, you need to find some so sort of canonical solution that will be picked out specially to solve that quadratic form. And to do this, you use this fact that this group is discrete and um, cofinite volume, and you can find a fundamental domain, and um, you can try to find a solution to this equation that lies in that fundamental domain. And so this is called reduction theory, and this is sort of the origin of, of algebraic groups. Um, so, so here we have this quadratic form, and then we can take the orthogonal group with integer coefficients, so we just take n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrices, which preserve this form. So in other words, you take a matrix and you act on x1 through xn plus 1, and um, the, the quadratic form will, um, will be the same. So q of a times x will be equal q of x for a and n, by, n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrix. So that's the orthogonal group preserved in that form, and then we just take the integral matrices there. So um, Vinberg showed that O of qnz contains a finite covolume reflection group um, for n less than or equal to 19. Um, this is a, a finite index. And um, in this case, O of QNR is equal to the isometries of HN. Um, there's a Lorentzian model for hyperbolic space, um, which I, well, I have a slide about this later, but I don't know if I'll have time to go over it. But anyways, um, this group is naturally identified with the isometries of HN, um, well, up to finite index. But anyways, um, so these, these groups here then give you lattices in hyperbolic space. Okay, another example that I talked about some, yesterday, um, we take G is SL2K, where K is um, a quadratic imaginary number field, and OD is the ring of integers, so then we take SL2OD, and um, when I take a quadratic imaginary number field and I tensor it with R over Q, because we're taking the square root of minus 1, we just get C. So K tensor Q with R is C, so we get a subgroup of GL2C, which as we saw, uh, well, if we projectivize, we get isometries of hyperbolic 3 space. So these are the Bianchi groups which were introduced in the 1890s, again, for um, number theoretic reasons. Bianchi was studying, these, um, studying certain types of quadratic, ternary quadratic forms, I think. Um, and so he, was, he studied like the fundamental domains of these groups. Um, another example defined by quadratic form here, we take a similar quadratic form Rn, but we take minus square root of 2 xn plus 1 squared. And now our field is k, q adjoined square root of 2, a totally real field. And um, we take the orthogonal group with entries in the ring of integers of this number field, and this gives another discrete group of isometries of Hn. Well, it's not quite so obvious in this case. Up there, we just had um, n by n integral matrices, so it's clearly discrete. They can't accumulate anywhere. Well, why in this case can't they accumulate? Well, you can't have a sequence of matrices that's converging to identity. So um, in this case, when I take Q adjoined square root of 2 tensored with R over Q, then um, 
there's a little, um, well, it's the restriction of scalars construction where um, you end up getting O of R N R, but you also get o crossed with O of R N bar R, or this is a subgroup of this anyways. And R N bar is just the Galois conjugate, and this is positive definite. So the group of matrices that preserve a, a positive definite compact form is just um, by the, um, well, uh, let's see, I forget the name of the theorem. The, um, anyways, it's, uh, it's a compact group. It's equivalent to O of uh, N plus 1 R. And so, um, so we have this compact group here and this non-compact group. And so this, this group here is um, the same as isometries of HN. And if we project on this factor, we have this discrete subset here because now in this group, um, the coefficients are just integers. Once we tensor with Q over R, now we just have a, an integer lattice in, um, in this vector space and therefore in this product of groups. So when we have this discrete thing here, when we project onto the non-compact factor, because we're only projecting out by this compact factor, we get something that's discrete. And so, um, so that's why this is a discrete subgroup. Um, you end up getting a discrete subgroup of hyperbolic space. So the most general version of an arithmetic group, you're allowed to take one of these integral constructions of a, of a Lie group. So this is actually a Lie group, I guess, in GL of 2n plus 2r. Um, and then we're projecting out, we're taking a subgroup of that and projecting out a compact factor. So that's how you get the most general form of a, of an, a linear arithmetic group. That's a linear um, arithmetic group, subgroup of an algebraic group. All right. Um, so some, exam some other examples, uh, which I just found out about this week, actually. Um, there's this theorem that just is appearing actually in July on the Journal of Algebra um, by Thierry Hill, uh, who showed that the smallest covolume cusp hyperbolic lattices, um, so the smallest orbifolds in dimensions two through nine, are given by, well, two and three, as I mentioned yesterday, were already solved, but um, so he classified the ones in four through nine, um, are given by these lattices here. And all of them are reflection groups, except for in dimension seven, where there's an extra symmetry of the polyhedron. So what the so these are um, Coxeter or Dinkin diagrams. So what this represents is you have a dot for every generator, and then you have an edge between every pair of generators if Mij is greater than two. So um, and generally we we ignore we just write an edge without a label if it's a three. Although I wrote wrote them here, but. Um, so, so these are the, um, if you look at non-compact um, orbifolds in these dimensions, these are the smallest volume examples. And um, the volumes are written here. So you end up getting, in even dimensions, by the chern gauss Binet theorem, you end up getting um, some, well, you can write it in terms of the Euler characteristic times a power of pi. Um, in odd dimensions, though, things are more complicated in terms of what the values of these volumes are. Well, this one's Apparis constant is known to be irrational, but th this one, as far as I know, is not known to be irrational. Um, but it's probably this is they're probably transcendental. Um, and this one's some other uh, L function value. So that's um, this is a very recent result. And his methods are he's using the cusp fact in a very strong way. When you have this cusp, you have this crystallographic group that that fixes the cusp. And you can use these packing arguments um, of Brodsky that I was mentioning, or similar things to that. And you can use the classification of crystallographic groups and the um, sphere packings um, in, in Euclidean space of one lower dimension. And that's, so that's what it's, he's, he's using to get these results. It's the same sort of thing that Meyerhoff used in three dimensions, um, but in higher dimensions, um, it's slightly more complicated. Now, um, Binberg proved that if I take an arithmetic reflection group in isometries of HN, um, then it's defined by a quadratic form in this way that I um, described a couple of slides ago. Um, and you can actually read off the quadratic form from um, the coordinates of the polyhedron that defines the fundamental domain. 
Um, now, I do have some slides explaining this, but I, I think I'm not going to have time to go into that. So it's actually not relevant to the, to the proof of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, now, a congruent subgroup of an arithmetic group, G of K, is one which contains, for some n, it contains, so gamma of n is, you take gamma and you intersect it with a principal congruent subgroup. So a principal congruent subgroup is um, defined by, you take all the, you take your matrices in GLN and um, you, take, you, you um, take their residue mod n and they should be congruent to the identity matrix mod n. So this is saying, so a matrix of this form, so an n by n matrix, that's a, all the entries are a multiple of n and I add the identity matrix, that, that's, um, these are exactly the matrices that are congruent to identity modulo n. This vanishes when I take it modulo n and I want to make sure it's invertible so I intersect it with GLN and then I take um, the intersection of that with gamma because G is a subgroup of GLN. So for ex the classical example of congruent subgroups when G is PSL2R and gamma is PSL2Z then um, gamma of n is ABCD congruent to the identity modulo n um, where AD minus BC is 1 and these are integral entries. Now, um, so these are the principal congruent subgroups now, an example of a congruent subgroup of PSL2R, um, which is not a subgroup of PSL2Z, is I can take the level 2 congruent subgroup, gamma of 2 here, which are congruent to the identity modulo 2, and I can adjoin this involution here. This is an element whose square, its trace is 0, its square is equal to 1. And it turns out that these two guys generate a discrete group um, which contains clearly gamma of 2. And so gamma prime is a congruent subgroup of PSL2R. This is called an atkin leonard involution. Basically, once you pass to this congruence 2 subgroup, there's a new symmetry that appears at the surface, and you can add that symmetry in, this involution here, and you get um, a, a different orbifold, which is not a subgroup of PSL2Z. Um, so, um, so a theorem then is that maximal arithmetic Hyperbolic groups are congruent. Um, so, I mean, this, this holds a little more generally, but um, this is proved by Long, McLaughlin, and Reed in, in three-dimensional cases for the Fuchsian and Kleinian groups. But the general case follows from some um, classification of maximal arithmetic groups is, that's part of the, the general theory of arithmetic groups developed by Borel. Um, <coughs> so there's there's a very precise number theoretic criterion for when an uh, arithmetic group is, is maximal, which I don't have time to go into, but it has to do with um, actions on buildings and various things. Um, okay, let's see. I guess I'm going to skip these. All right, so, um, so now we've, we've introduced um, the reflection groups and arithmetic groups. Um, now, one of the tools that I'm going to use is the First eigenvalue of the Laplacian. So the Laplacian delta is minus div um, composed with grad. So this is an elliptic operator um, that's defined on any Riemannian metric. So um, we can define it on Hn, but because Hn is homogeneous, it's a symmetric space, um, the Laplacian is invariant in the isometries of Hn, so it descends to an elliptic operator on um, any orbifold quotient, Hn mod gamma, which I'll call O here. So I wanted to find the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian. Um, so let f be a function on our orbifold, uh, be an L-squared function if this is finite volume, so it has, um, uh, its square has finite integral over the orbifold. And um, let's assume it's Lipschitz for simplicity. Uh, the integral, um, let's assume that the integral of f over the orbifold is zero. What, what this means is that f is, is L squared orthogonal to the constant function. This is the, um, if we have the, inner pro, you know, the integral of f times g is an inner product, then this is the integral against the constant function. <coughs> so, um, so f has average zero. And when hn mod gamma has finite volume, the, um, the minimal eigenvalue, so delta is a positive operator. All of its eigenvalues will be non-negative. Um, the minimum eigenvalue is zero, g 
given by the constant eigenfunction, since it's finite volume, the constant eigenfunction is L squared, and um, its Laplacian is zero. Um, then the first non-zero eigenvalue is called lambda one of gamma. So the various eigenvalues of Laplacian are lambda one, lambda two, et cetera. They might have some multiplicities of uh, eigenfunctions, but um, lambda one is the minimum non-zero eigenvalue. So this is a very important um, invariant of Riemannian manifolds um, that crops up a lot in um, Riemannian geometry. And you can also define this first eigenvalue. Well, so when, when, delta, when um, the orbifold is non-compact, it's a little more complicated. I mean, there's not necessarily an eigenfunction for this eigenvalue, but the way you can define it is via the Rayleigh-Ritz quotient. So you take um, the integral of the gradient of S squared divided by the integral of F squared, um, and we'll, where integral of F is zero. And then this, this infimum is equal to the first eigenvalue. So this assumption here that um, the, its average is zero is saying it's orthogonal to the constant eigenspace. So the, the Rayleigh principle says that you can, you can compute each eigenvalue successively by taking, um, you, you find the, first, the, the smallest eigenvalue eigenspace via this minimization procedure, and then you want to take functions that are orthogonal to the eigenspaces of the lower dimensional eigenvalues to get the next eigenvalue um, when you take this sort of quotient. Um, so this, this here, if I integrate by parts, um, it's equal to the integral of f, f uh, del f. And um, now if, so if I plug in, if delta f equals lambda 1 f, and I plug that into here, then I just get the integral of lambda 1 f squared. And so this ratio, if this is realized by an eigenfunction, then this, then this integral up here is just lambda 1 times integral of f squared. So you get lambda 1 out. But if, if it's, if it's non-compact, then you can define the first eigenvalue this way. Otherwise, you have to do it via some more heavy-duty uh, analytic machinery. So there's a theorem of Selberg that the first eigenvalue of congruence surfaces so the, the level n congruent suburb of PSL2z is greater than or equal to 3 16 And um, he conjectured that the first eigenvalue of gamma of n is greater than or equal to 1 quarter. This is the, this is the smallest it could possibly be because the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian on H2, this is with um, functions which are L squared on H2, is precisely 1 quarter. And as you, as you take the congruence groups, you get these surfaces which get larger and larger um, area. And so the first, you can, there's a simple argument using Rayleigh-Ritz to show that you can take these eigenfunctions from the universal cover and project them down and get eigenfunctions here, which are one quarter. So, um, which has uh, eigenvalue one quarter. So this is the best you could do, possibly. <coughs> now, um, there's a generalization of Selberg's result to higher dimensions. It's a theorem of Jacquet and Langlands and um, Gelbart and Jacquet. And then Vigneris um, applied their results to the two-dimensional case um, and three-dimensional case. So if gamma is a congruence arithmetic subgroup of PSL2C, then lambda 1 is greater than or equal to 3 quarters. And if it's a Fuchsian subgroup, the lambda 1 is greater than or equal to 3 16 so, um, so this is a very deep theorem of, um, in the theory of automorphic forms. Um, and then Berger and Sarnak use an inductive argument to show you can induce um, these inequalities here to um, inequalities for higher dimensions. So if gamma is a congruent subgroup of isometries of Hn for n greater than or equal to 3, and it's defined by a quadratic form, similar to the examples I described, then the first eigenvalue is greater than or equal to 2 minus, 2n minus 3 over 4. <coughs> so. Um, Geometrically, what this, um, what this eigenvalue estimate means is there's this equivalence of the first eigenvalue with the Cheeger constant. So the Cheeger constant is, well, I'm not going to explain exactly what it means, but it would, um, if you have a sequence of manifolds whose first eigenvalue is going to zero, then they sort of have these necks inside of them that squeeze down and um, divide the manifold into two pieces that of fairly comparable volume. Um, so what these saying that this first eigenvalue is bounded away from zero is saying that the manifold 
their orbital fold is sort of rounded. It doesn't have these sort of necks or narrows um, where, uh, where things get sort of cinched down. Um, and this, there's a generalization of Selberg's conjecture to higher dimensions called the generalized Ramanujan conjecture. And amazingly, this is some translation of the theory of automorphic forms that has to do, Ramanujan's actual conjecture has to do with coefficients of, um, of various um, automorphic forms, uh, the Fourier series for certain automorphic forms. So it's an amazing uh, translation from number theory that I don't really understand, actually. Um, <clears throat> So now uh, we'll put the two together to talk about arithmetic reflection groups, so, uh, which I've already given some examples of. So um, if, oh, and I, sh I should have mentioned that Hild's examples in dimensions two through nine, those are all were arithmetic reflection groups that he had there. Um, <clears throat> so we have a polyhedron in HN with dihedral angles of the form pi over N, and um, we have an associated Coxer group, gamma P. Then gamma P is a maximal reflection group if it's not a subgroup of another reflection group. So there's no, um, there's no poly reflection polyhedron Q, Q contained in P, so that P is tiled by copies of Q. Um, so gamma P is not a subgroup of gamma Q. Then it's a maximal reflection group. So for example, uh, this example I had yesterday of the minimal co-volume uh, Kleinian group, um, or the index two subgroup of it, um, this, this is a maximal um, reflection, it's, it's a maximal reflection group in, in three dimensions because it's the minimal co-volume orbifold defined by reflections in H3. And um, this polyhedron here is just the um, regular ideal tetrahedron that I had pictures of yesterday and um, this is not maximal because it admits these symmetries. So there's this um, reflection symmetries here, an S4 group of symmetries here acting, and the quotient is this um, PSL203 that I um, had a picture of yesterday. So, so this is a reflection group which is not maximal because it's contained um, in, a, in a larger reflection group. So the orbifold covers a smaller reflection orbifold. <coughs> Now, uh, Long, McLaughlin, and Reed show that there's only finitely many arithmetic maximal Fuchsian in two dimension reflection groups. So this 237 example that I had a picture of earlier is, a, is an arithmetic reflection group, but there's only finitely many of these in two dimensions. This generalizes the result of Denon um, for non compact congruence genus zero arithmetic Fuchsian subgroups. So these are, these are groups which are commensurable with PSL2Z, like that example I had earlier, gamma prime. Um, now this was reproved, so Denon sort of did this combinatorially. Um, this is also proved by Thompson, um, and it was reproved later by Zograff using spectral techniques, so using the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian. Um, so I, I generalized this two-dimensional case to three dimensions, um, so there's only finally many arithmetic Kleinian uh, three-dimensional reflection groups. And then um, just last year, um, we generalize this to every dimension, and independently, Nikulin um, proved this using, um, using his techniques, um, but depending on these two previous results, the two and three dimensional case. Um, so using a two and three dimensional case, he was able to prove it in higher dimensions. And I should say that Nikulin had results on this before. He had proven this already for dimensions 10 and higher. Um, so it was only, there was only unknown for dimensions four through nine. Um, I had another slide about this, but I skipped over it. So anyways, oh, no, it's, sorry, it's at the bottom here, All right, okay. Um, and Nikulin had also proven it for non-compact reflection groups in all dimensions. So, um, so really, we only had to prove it for compact groups in dimensions four through nine. That was what, what's missing. But the proof that we give is independent of Nikulin's previous arguments, and it works in each dimension one at a time. But by this result of Prokhorov, there's no reflection groups in dimensions greater than or equal to 9 or 96. So it's, we just need to find this result in each dimension, and then we get this. So, so now I'll, um, I'll sketch the argument. 
Um, so this is a, this generalization of Zograss proof um, goes by um, comparison of the first eigenvalue in two different ways. So let gamma p be an arithmetic maximal reflection group. So it's arithmetic and it's maximal in the in the category of reflection groups. Then there exists a unique maximal arithmetic group gamma naught, which is no longer a reflection group potentially, like this example of Hild in um, that had this extra Z2 symmetry that wasn't a reflection. Then um, gamma p is normal in gamma naught. And so there's this canonical um, maximal group which contains it. Um, so there's some, there's some finite group theta um, less than this maximal group, which is a group of the group of symmetries of this polyhedron. So you may have a maximal reflection group, but there may be these extra symmetries which are not reflection symmetries. And you see this in this example of the smallest volume <coughs> orbifold in, in three dimensions. There's this extra symmetry here, and the quotient is, a, is an orbifold um, which has this extra Z2 symmetry. So this is a maximal arithmetic group now, and therefore by Berger and Sarnak, its first eigenvalue is going to be greater than or equal to 2n minus 3 over 4. And um, so what what we need to do is estimate this first eigenvalue from above. So we have a lower bound on the eigenvalue. We want to estimate from above in order to get a finiteness result, to get some restrictions on the possibilities for gamma naught. And to do this, we use this uh, notion of conformal volume due to Lee and Yao. So this is actually what Zograv used, a two-dimensional version of this. And Lee and Yao generalized this to higher dimensions. Um, oh, here I was just pointing out that this inequality falls because gamma naught is a maximal group and therefore congruence. And we actually don't know, even though P, uh, gamma P is a maximal reflection group, it might not be a congruence group, and so we don't necessarily know that it, um, it might have some sort of narrow, um, I mean, it might be sort of thin at one part, but then when you quotient out by the symmetries, it, the, the quotient guy becomes sort of fat again. So, um, so that's why we have to pass to this gamma naught first in order to apply this um, deep fact from the theory of automorphic forms. Is, is there any questions so far? So th this is the, so what I wanted to talk about now was, um, so any questions? All right, so, um, so I wanted to talk about this conformal volume for a little bit, which I think is a, is a nice um, piece of Ramanian geometry. Um, <coughs> so the conformal volume in an orbifold is um, you let O be an orbifold with a Ramanian metric, and um, phi taking O to Sn is a piecewise conformal map. So you can imagine if you have a hyperbolic orbifold, that you just cut it up into a bunch of tetrahedra and you want to make sure that your map is conformal on each of those tetrahedra. Mm -hmm. So um, in two dimensions, it's very easy to get conformal maps because of the uniformization theorems. Things are very flexible. But in higher dimensions, conformal maps are much more restricted because of Louisville's theorem. At least if you have conformal maps from one dimension to the same dimension. If any subset of Euclidean space of dimension n, if I have a conformal map to Euclidean space of dimension n, Liouville's theorem says any open subset, then it actually has to be a restriction of a Mobius transformation. So conformal maps are much more rigid in three or higher dimensions. But here we're allowed to map to, to a higher dimensional sphere. So it could be some, some sort of wacky subset, but it, as long as it's still conformal. So um, we'll define the conformal, the piecewise conformal volume of, of phi to be, what we do is we take the image of, well, this is sort of lying a bit, but the, we, we look at its image in SN, and then we take the volume of the image. So really what I mean is you want to pull back the, um, the m-dimensional um, volume form from SN and integrate it over your orbifold. But basically, you're just looking at the volume of the image if it's generic. And um, then take the supremum of that over all Mobius transformations of SN. So the Mobius transformations of SN, I guess I didn't define these, but what these are is really the restriction of hyperbolic isometries of dimension n plus 1 in the, in the ball model of hyperbolic space. Um, so these transformations 
they can take, you can take any subset to an arbitrarily small subset, uh, like Eric was talking about for convergence groups. So this is a convergence group action on SN. Um, but, um, be, but what here, since we're taking the supremum, we sort of want to move it around until we get his volume as large as possible, and then that, take that supremum. And now the, the piecewise conformal volume of the orbifold in n dimensions, we take the infinitum of all piecewise conformal maps to SN. Now, um, well, this is only defined if there is some piecewise conformal map. Now, um, you can do this for large enough n. In fact, there's an explicit n because there's this, this Nash embedding theorem says that any Riemannian manifold can be embedded in Euclidean manifold of large enough dimension. And um, certainly if I have a, well, if I have a isometry into um, a Euclidean manifold, then it's going to be a conformal map into the corresponding three sphere. You just um, take stereographic projection to the n-dimensional three, uh, sorry, not three sphere, n-sphere. Take stereographic projection to an n-sphere, which is a conformal map. So this will exist for high enough n. Um, so there's a theorem then of El Sufi and Ilias, um, which says that the first eigenvalue of the orbifold times its volume to the power of 2 over m is less than or equal to essentially the conformal volume. So, um, so now the, the strategy of this argument is we have, we have a lower bound on the volume of our orbifold, uh, sorry, on the first eigenvalue of our orbifold. And if we can get an upper bound on the conformal volume, then we get an upper bound on the volume of the orbifold. But um, there's a theorem of Wang that says in four dimensions or higher, the volumes of hyperbolic orbifolds are discrete. So unlike two or three dimensions where it's well ordered, in four or higher dimensions, the volumes are discrete. So if you can get some bound in the volume here, then um, we can show there's only finitely many. So um, the theorem of El Sufi and Ilias has a long history. It's based on arguments of Zago, who, talked, who had some sort of estimates on the first eigenvalue of planar domains. Um, and Hirsch had um, an eigenvalue estimate for the round two sphere. So um, if you take um, the first eigenvalue of, the, of, a two, of any arbitrary metric on the two sphere times the area, that's scale invariant, then that's minimized precisely for the round two sphere. That's what Hirsch proved. Then Yang and Yao generalize this to two-dimensional surfaces in general, and Li and Yao introduced this for um, higher dimensions. Okay, so um, the idea of the proof is you want to use the co coordinate functions on SN as test functions for the Rayleigh-Ritz quotient to estimate the first eigenvalue from above. Well, when I have this, when I have this map um, from my orbifold to the n-sphere, well, if you just have an arbitrary map, it's not going to be, um, the, the coordinate functions are not going to have average zero over that, over that um, the image of the orbifold. So the idea is you use the Mobius transformation to push that orbifold around until its center mass is precisely at the origin. And so this is uh, a nice degree argument that you can do this. Um, so, this is actually the only bit of topology in this talk, I guess. But uh, so, um, if we have a piecewise conformal map to the n sphere, then we can find a Mobius transformation such that um, the center mass of the the volume form of the overfold is at the origin of R n plus one. So um, really, the, so here's a picture of this overfold, and if if its n is two dimensions, and um, for a Mobius transformation, I can um, well, I can translate, it's, it's a hyperbolic, trans, it's a corresponding isometry of hyperbolic space. So I can take the origin, I can translate it up. And if I have a map of this overfold in, this overfold is going to accumulate down uh, to the north pole. And the center of mass, obviously, is going to accumulate up here. Well, I can translate back, and the overfold is going to grow in size, pass through the equator, and then it's going to go, when I translate all the way back down to the south pole, it's going to get very small, and the center of mass of this measure is going to get concentrated at the south pole. So obviously by the intermediate value theorem, somewhere in between, the center mass is going to, at least in the vertical direction, is going to be precisely at the equator. Now you can do this in all directions simultaneously, and you actually get this, this a map from the, so 
one of these conformal transformations is uniquely determined up to rotation by a point in HN. So I can send this point to this point by a translation in hyperbolic space, which gives me a Mobius transformation acting on the boundary. And so you get a map from HN, and it extends to the boundary, which is the identity on the boundary. Um, and um, it's a degree one map. So a degree one map of the ball under the ball has to send some point to the origin. So there's going to be a, so it's a generalized intermediate value theorem argument. It says that there's going to be um, some point where the measure is concentrated there. And now, um, now there's a bit of analysis where you, you use the fact that the sum of the coordinate functions on the n-sphere is equal to 1. The sum of the coordinate functions squared is equal to 1. Um, and you can, you can get an estimate of the eigenvalue coming from using these coordinate functions as test functions. So I guess I'm, gonna, I'm not going to describe that part of it, but um, it's, it's a little bit of, a, of inequalities. So now, um, so now I'll explain the, the, the finish off the, the rest of the argument. So, um, so there's a theorem that if um, there's a constant depending on dimensions such that if I have a finite subgroup of, uh, of rotations of n plus 1 dimensional space, then the conformal volume of Sn modulo that group is less than this constant times the order of the group to some power. So it grows polynomially with the order of the group in, um, in a fixed dimension. So Sn modulo a finite group is just an elliptic orbifold. It's Sn modulo a finite group is, is um, an orbifold with, with positive curvature. Um, so we can estimate this conformal volume of this. Now, um, if I have a polyhedron in HN, then the polyhedron HN in the ball model embeds conformally inside of SN. And um, so it's just like the upper half space of, of SN, if you like. And so um, this polyhedron then bends in SN conformally. And if I have a finite group acting on the polyhedron, then it embeds into a finite, this finite group acts on all of Sn. So I get a, a conformal embedding of the polyhedron modulo of this finite group into this elliptic orbifold. And um, it's, it's elementary to see that the conformal volume of this, when you have a conformal embedding like this, the conformal volume here is less than or equal to the conformal volume here. So if I look at um, the image of the, you know, I have some map of, of this orbifold into a higher dimensional sphere, then it's going to restrict to a map of this orbifold, which will have smaller volume. <clears throat> so, um, in order to estimate the conformal volume of my uh, my orbifold from above, I only have to estimate the conformal volume in an elliptic orbifold. Um, so, th there's a theorem of Belopetsky that says, in dimensions greater than three, there's constants C n and delta n such that if I have an arithmetic group and it's defined over a number field k, so I haven't really defined what, it, what, it, um, what the number field is associated with the arithmetic group, but you can guess from those examples I gave, there was one that was defined over q, and one was defined over q joint square root of 2, et cetera. So anyways, there's an associated field to an arithmetic group, and um, the volume grows um, with the discriminant of the number field. It grows uh, polynomially with the discriminant of the number field. But the order of the um, the order of the fixed points that if I have a finite group of rotations in an um, arithmetic group defined over a number field of uh, of degree of um, in dimension n, then the the order of the group goes at most polynomially with the degree of the number field. But it turns out that the discriminants of number field grow grow exponentially with the degree. Um, so, so this falls from Minkowski's theorem. So this estimate here comes basically from certain arithmetic formulas for volumes of um, arithmetic um, orbifolds, maximal arithmetic uh, orbifolds, or maximal arithmetic groups, the corresponding minimal um, orbifolds, where um, the, there's a term in this formula, there's a term that's a zeta function, there's other terms, but there's a term which is, corresponds to the discriminant of the number field. And that's sort of the dominant term of this volume formula, at least in dimensions four and higher. And so that's, that's roughly where this, uh, this estimate comes from.
So anyways, the volume is growing exponentially with the degree of the number field, whereas the, the, group of, uh, the, the maximal group of symmetries of the polyhedron is only growing polynomially. So the, the proof finishes off then by um, putting these results together. So the, if I take this maximal arithmetic group containing my reflection polyhedron with finite index, then um, from the eigenvalue estimate, the volume is uh, growing only polynomially with the degree of the number field, the estimate from above. But the estimate from below coming from the discriminant um, estimate over there shows that the volume grows exponentially with the number field. So obviously um, the lower bound is going to overtake the upper bound at some point and that means that the degree of the number field that's defined over has to be bounded. But that means if the degree of the number field is bounded then the volume is bounded by this part here so the volume has to be universally bounded but then by Wang's theorem there's only going to be finally many possible examples for these gamma knots and therefore for the reflection subgroups. So the subgroup of a group that's generated by reflections is canonically determined. So anyways, this is the, this is the outline of the argument. Um, now some examples. If gamma is PGL2K, so in the three-dimensional case, um, D is the discriminant of the number field is just D where K is Q adjoined square to minus D. Um, uh, well, depending on the congruence, you, you might have, this might not necessarily be square free, but anyways, um, from these, in the, in the three-dimensional case, you can get a very explicit formula on the volume. All this stuff can be made very explicit, and you can see that the, um, the discriminant number field is bounded by 10 to the 8th. Um, so again, there's some discrepancy between this estimate and what's known. The, um, you can see that there's um, reflection groups for a discriminant up to minus 84. Um, so Alan Hatcher has taken, um, well, as I, as I mentioned before, these Bianchi groups um, were studied by Bianchi in the 1890s, and he found some fundamental domains for them. And then in the 70s, Riley found um, fundamental domains for a, a bunch more of these Bianchi groups. And then Hatcher took this data and he he glued the faces together and found explicit representations of these orbifolds in, in three dimensions. Um, and I circled the ones here that contain or, or that are contained um, commensable with the reflection group. So you can just you can just look at the reflection symmetries of the diagram and see that um, these guys are commensable with the reflection group for these particular examples. And you can go all the way up to 84, as I mentioned over here. Um, Hatcher has some other pictures which are more complicated, which don't necessarily lie in, in um, <coughs> the overflow doesn't lie in R3, but it's, um, but you can still determine that there's a reflection group there. Um, all right, so my last slide then, well, I conjecture that there's, um, in any dimension, the conformal volume of elliptic overflow is, is bounded, and, um, if that were true, uh, this would simplify the argument quite a bit, and you'd be able to make it very explicit. Um, so hopefully, eventually one day, we'll have a complete list of all the, mer all the, all the maximal arithmetic reflection groups. Um, and it might be possible to do this explicitly in 2D. I guess you can't really read that. Um, just the other, well, while I was, I, earlier this week, um, I, I wrote this guy, Chris Cummins, in Canada, and he gave me all the... Um, all the four domains for the, the two-dimensional, non-compact, maximal, arithmetic, uh, discrete groups. Um, and I went through the list and I found 23, um, I found there's exactly 23 non-compact, maximal, arithmetic, Fuchsian, um, Fuchsian groups. Um, so, so what he did is, he, sorry, he computed the genus zero groups, which are maximal. Um, now, um, an interesting question is whether there's a maximal reflection group which is not congruent. So if the polyhedron itself were a congruence group, then you would get an estimate on the first eigenvalue of that, and using this um, El Sufi estimate, Ilias estimate, you would um, you'd be able to get a much better control on the volumes of these overfolds. But so far I don't know this, so I'm going to 
Actually, I'm going to try to figure out whether these examples here are, are the reflection groups congruence, but I haven't been able to do that yet. Um, there's an interesting fact about these genus zero groups. Remember, for a congruence group, there's a cer certain level of principal congruence subgroup that it contains. That's this number n, gamma of n. And for these genus zero groups, the number n that occur, the prime factors are all, the, they're all um, numbers that occur, they're, they're precisely the prime factors of the order of the monster group. And um, these genus zero groups turn out to be related, and their automorphic forms turn out to be related to, uh, to the monster group and this stuff called monstrous moonshine. And, um, so it's a pretty interesting, um, it's a pretty interesting subject. But anyways, the, the reflection groups, so this, these reflection groups, studying this in higher dimensions is sort of an analog of studying these genus zero groups in two dimensions. All right, so um, I'll stop there.